Okay, so today we'll be talking about uh, decision making. Uh, and this is a, an important aspect of modeling and understanding sort of uh, economic and, and rationality behavior um, to achieve specific objectives. So when we think about structuring decisions, um, there are a couple ways we can uh, sort of formally structure um, some kind of system to help us understand both qualitatively and quantitatively um, how you can go about modeling decision-making. So one is identifying the objective, um, describing the context of the decision and then understanding what decision options there actually exist. Um, and then one important aspect of um, the sort of decision-making uh, modeling that we're getting into is that uh, it, can allow, it can allow you to capture uh, uncertain outcomes, uh, which there's almost always uh, uncertainty present. Okay, so in an analytical approach to decision making, we're going to look at three categories of structuring uh, this, and, and we're mainly going to focus on on the last one today, <clears throat> but we'll we'll cover the, the first two as well. Um, and this isn't the only sort of formal structures that exist for decision making, but these are sort of three common ones um, in sort of the world of, of decision-making uh, uh, models. So we'll be thinking about uh, fundamental objective hierarchy uh, and then sort of building this up to thinking about influence diagrams and ultimately decision trees. Um, both influence diagrams and decision trees um, provide approaches that help us structure decisions and alternatives, uncertain events, um, and sort of final outcomes uh, or, or objectives. Um, but I think the, the sort of best way to, to start out in thinking about how you build structures for both of these models is to look at this first one, which is a fundamental objective hierarchy. So, um, this starting example, let's just look at the example first and then we can talk about kind of the structure of this thing. Um, so if your objective is to sort of make as much money as possible, uh, we can think about you know, different ways to achieve that. You, you can, for example, increase your current salary. Okay, how would I go about doing that? I could either find a new job or get a raise. I wanna find a new job. You know, I would have to go about updating my resume, networking. Um, if I wanted to get a raise, you know, I'd have to do better at whatever it is that I'm doing. Um, alternative ways that I could increase my lifetime earnings, I could marry someone who's really rich, um, or I could go back to school, uh, or, you know, go to school, uh, get degrees, um, undergrad, grad school. So this seems kind of like a sort of fairly simple example, but hopefully you guys can see how the sort of structure of this allows us to organize, um, organize our sort of decisions um, into very sort of concrete structures that, that ultimately get us to our objective. Um, and so you can see kind of how we go from our uh, means to an end. That's sort of how these are um, hierarchies are, are always structured. Um, this allows us to identify higher levels uh, of objectives very easily. Um, and each of the higher level objectives can provide a basis for your uh, lower level objectives. We can see directly kind of how they correspond to each other. It helps identify missing objectives. Um, and in this case, you know, when we, when we think about, oh, increased lifetime earnings, that's kind of a, you know, ethereal 
type of uh, goal because there's many different ways that you could go about doing this. Um, but it's a lot easier to identify attributes to uh, of achieving sort of lower level objectives, like in very sort of concretely, you know, update my resume, uh, for example, and, and that will sort of ultimately move towards uh, your final objective of, of increasing your, your lifetime earnings. Okay, any questions about this so far? We'll continue on. Um, so we're gonna talk about influence diagrams next. Um, and both influence diagrams and decision trees kind of share um, this kind of symbology um, as a notation for describing what's happening in kind of the, the network graphs that, that we'll be drawing. So um, this is important to keep in mind. So the squares are decision, uh, these are decision nodes. Um, this is where uh, there can be sort of different outcomes based off of a decision that you make. Um, circles represent chance events. Um, so this is similar to the decision node in the sense that uh, you can, you'll have sort of different outcomes res resulting from probabilistic events. Um, but note that chance events are kind of essentially out of your control. Uh, typically we denote the outcome uh, as this kind of diamond, it's a consequence or, or payoff. Uh, and then sometimes you'll see um, this uh, like rectangles with rounded edges that typically represent these in between sort of calculations or constants. Not, it's not um, always the case that, that you'll see uh, necessarily all of these nodes within a particular, um, particular graph. So we can think about that previous example and how that might get structured in an influence diagram. Um, and the way this works is that uh, it can show sort of direct uh, outcome results um, from any sort of decision or, or chance node. So in this case, you know, going to school, um, undergrad, grad school, or work, that all leads to uh, finding a better job, which um, uh, both of these things can lead to chance outcomes of uh, higher salaries. Um, and that ultimately leads to the, your final calculation for, for lifetime earnings. So still um, relatively straightforward, uh, and that brings us to kind of the main focus of today's lecture, uh, thinking about um, decision trees. So decision trees uh, are structured, so we read them from left to right. Um, and this is really where we can inject sort of quantitative analysis into um, decision-making options. Um, Essentially what we're gonna be doing is calculating the expected value of each option. Um, this will let you calculate values for chance nodes, picking the best option at decision nodes. Um, and typically we make trees using um, some sort of like expected value calculation or MPV or profit as the outcome. Um, so typically these things are calculated in, in terms, um, in like monetary terms, uh, but it's also fairly common to represent uh, these things as utilities. And so we're going to look at a bunch of examples of decision trees. Um, so hopefully this will be clear to everyone by the end of the day. So our first example is um, this actually sort of real world situation that happened in a lawsuit between Texaco versus Pennzoil. Um, so uh, 
these two companies are embroiled in a legal battle. Um, and if you are representing the company Pennzoil, there's this question of how much you decide whether or not to sell. So suppose that you, were, you have sort of access to sort of the following um, information. You know that, okay, Texaco, uh, you're in negotiations with them uh, and they are offering you a $2 billion settlement. Um, and so you can settle with them and take the $2 billion or you can make a counter offer with $5 billion, uh, for, um, a counter offer of $5 billion. So you, those are kind of the decisions that you are able to make. Uh, and then you can estimate sort of probabilities of what would happen if you made any particular decision. So if you decide to settle, well, that, that's that, you end up with $2 billion. Um, but if you choose to make a counter offer, then you know, there's some percentage of the time that Texaco will accept that counter offer and pay you uh, that settlement amount. Um, there is some probability that Texaco says, no, we don't accept that counter offer, let's go to court. Um, and then there's some po possibility that Texaco provides another counter offer to sell for 3 billion. Um, and then in that second uh, counter offer, you have another decision to make, which is should I take that counter offer or should I still go to court? And if you go to court, you have some chance to um, win uh, some money uh, of different varying amounts and some chance to lose. So if I were to just to ask you right now, okay, like what would you decide to do um, that that decision may seem um, uh, you'd have to go uh, go about and, and, and think about how to sort of calculate the, the um, possible outcomes uh, of, of any decision. So we're gonna do that with uh, this decision tree. So let me go ahead to the whiteboard and we'll go ahead and um, draw out this example. Okay, so we're gonna start off with a square node. Um, and so this is a decision node. And this will represent our first decision D1. And let's suppose you make a decision to settle. Um, this will lead to an outcome that we know, right? So this was the $2 billion. So that represents um, kind of the simplest outcome here. We don't need to make any further calculations. Um, however, we do have the possibility of doing a counter offer counter offer of 5 billion. Um, and note, because these branches are coming out of a square node, we are ultimately in control of which, um, which thing in D1 that we wanna, uh, we wanna make, which decision. So here we have our first chance node. And we have three possible outcomes. So here, uh, this is 17% accept counter. Um, so if Texaco accepts the counter offer, then you make $5 billion here. Um, there is a 50% chance this will go to court. And that will lead to a separate chance node. Um, and then the last one is 37% uh, new counter offer. And if we get, um, 
if we could get to this stage, you then arrive at a second decision node. Uh, and we'll call this D, oops, that's a poorly written D, D2. Uh, and now you have a, a, another decision to make. Um, you can uh, accept the counter offer of $3 billion. Um, so accept new counter, or you can go to court. Reject that counter offer. And we know that if you go to court, there are three possible outcomes and it's the same in both cases. Uh, there is a 20% chance you receive uh, $10.3 billion. There's a 50% chance you receive $5 billion. And then there's a 30% chance that you get nothing. And that's the same here. So the end of the branches represents all sort of possible outcomes um, of this decision tree. And so now the question is, how do I go about figuring out um, which decision that I'm making? And we can essentially move through the tree and, and sort of solve uh, for the best decision that you could make given this, um, the uh, probability outcomes um, associated with, with any particular uh, uh, decision or, or chance. So uh, there are four decisions that, that we have here, D1, is to settle and that's easy. We know that you get um, $2 billion. Uh, and then for decision two, uh, the easiest one we also know is that you can settle and that's $3 billion. Okay, so what happens if we go to court for decision two? Um, I can calculate this explicitly. Um, so this is 10.3 times the probability of 0.2 uh, plus um, five times the probability 0.5. And this would lead to uh, this outcome of $4.56 billion. Okay, so if I'm looking specifically at decision two, um, my expected value for each of these decisions is shown here. Uh, so I can, you can see that uh, getting $4.56 billion expected is a uh, higher than the settlement. So if I were to be uh, already in decision two, I would definitely prefer to uh, go to court. Okay, and so um, we'll say this is your optimal decision that you would give in uh, decision two. Okay, so now let's think about D1. Uh, no settle, right? This, this is my other, other option. And I can do the same thing here. So 17% of the time I would get 5 billion. So it'd be five times 0.17 plus 50% um, 50, 50 of the time um, I would go to court. 
Uh, and we know that the outcome from the court, we calculated it before, it's the same thing. So it's actually 4.56 times 0.5, which corresponds to um, the probability it would go to court. Um, plus, okay, if I were to go into my decision node two, there are two possible, um, there are two possible things. I could get three um, billion, or I could get um, point. Uh, oh, hang on one sec. Four point five six, um, and then this quantity would get multiplied by point three seven. Um, and I'm going to choose, we already know that I'm going to choose 4.56 because that's the better option. So you can kind of solve for the <clears throat> upstream decisions uh, first. So then ultimately I would take this times this times this. And this would be uh, 4.6348 billion dollars. So between my decision one here, uh, if I look at my decision to settle versus not settle, we can see that the expected value of uh, not settling is $4.6 billion, which is higher than the 2 billion. So you know that the optimal decision here is to not settle. And then if you get offered a, a new counter offer, then, the, then you would want to um, go to court. Okay. Any questions about this? Um, hi, Alan. I have a question about um, the 4.56 billion thing. Um, yes. Because I feel like they all either only get 5 billion or 10.3 billion. So my understanding is that I have a 70% of chance of earning something that's more than 5 billion. That's so right. I don't really understand the number 4.56. Does it really have a meaning? Or, or it only means that I will have something that's more than uh, I will have so, a chance that's not zero billion. So yeah, yeah. So uh, note that these probabilities are here. So um, I guess I kind of omitted something, right? So ten point three and five are both higher than five, but you uh, also have um, uh, an another term, right? So ten point three times twenty percent plus. Uh, Five times 0 0.5 plus zero times 0 0.3, right? So these only account for 70% of the outcomes. Mm -hmm. So it ends up being, uh, the expected value ends up being slightly lower than, uh, than even 5 billion, mm -hmm. right? Because you also have zero yeah. in there. Um, okay, so I see a question in the chat. How do you go about calculating the probabilities? So those are kind of known uh, in this particular problem. Um, and they, so this will, um, this will, this is an important concept that, that you're trying to estimate kind of potential probabilities of, of outcomes. Um, if you don't know, that there are ways that we kind of deal with this in, in uncertainty if you, if you don't know, and we'll look at kind of some versions of that. Um, but in the context of this particular problem, it's, it's kind of just provided as, as a known quantity. Um, there are complex ways of kind of going about um, solving for the tree with unknown probabilities, and then you can assess yourself like if you solve for 
for P, for example, like you could say, oh, what would the probabilities of specific outcomes have to be such that I would change my decision in, in one way or another, right? And so um, you can imagine, for example, in this case, if my, if the probabilities for these guys were to decrease, you know, if they decrease enough, then, you know, it may be actually optimal to change your decision. Um, so what, what you could do is um, see at which point, you know, the probabilities would change enough that, that it would cause you to, to, to change your decision and then think about how likely it is that those probabilities get to, get to that sort of limit. So yeah, so short answer is you, you're kind of given this, this information in, in the context of this problem. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess my answer was more like taking a step back. Like yeah. uh, if we were looking at this case in like real life, would we take a look at, you know, past judge decisions or like, like where would, how would we like get those percent? And, and maybe, you know, maybe I'm thinking about it too, um, you know, too, too much, but, but I'm kind of curious, like in a real life scenario, how could we get these probabilities? Yeah, so sometimes the probabilities will simply be known. And we're actually gonna look at an easy example of, of like a, uh, where, where, the, where you would definitely know the probabilities. Um, in other cases, something like this, uh, that if I were to think about this in, in real life, um, yeah, you could look at like historic precedents for this type of thing, but um, you know, oftentimes you'd be relying on the expertise of people who are familiar with with you know the case. The, this case, for example, you know, it's it's pretty likely that um, that the lawyers would probably have some idea of how likely it is that you know a counteroffer would be accepted or or, or not, and and. Um, and so uh, it can come down to sort of illicit judgments um, or explicit judgments of, of people who have expertise in, in the area, uh, or it could be, you know, quantities that, that, that would be known. Okay, so let's jump on back to our slides. Okay, I need a volunteer for um, our little game show that we're going to play right now. Who wants to win something? No one? Volunteer. All right. Duncan, great. Are you familiar with the Monty Hall problem? Um, uh, I think I've heard of it, but I, I don't remember what it is. Okay, great. Uh, so, simple game. We have three doors. Um, behind one door is a uh, is a great, a fabulous prize. Okay. Let's say you get a, a shiny new car behind one of the doors. And the other two doors, um, there's a goat. So you lose if you, if you get the goat, unfortunately. Um, so let's go ahead and close all three doors, one, two, or three. Um, this, is, this picture is just for kind of illustrative purposes. Um, there may or may not be a goat behind door number three. So okay. I, I tell you, okay, there's a car behind one of these doors. Go ahead and pick a door. So you say. Door one. Door one, great, okay. Um, so you've selected door one. Door one. Uh, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to open 
one of the other two doors and I'm gonna show you. Uh, so we'll just use this picture as a direct example. And I'm gonna open door three and I'm gonna say, hey, look, behind door three, there is a goat. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna tell, ask you now, would you like to switch doors? Hmm. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Your your time's running out. You gotta you gotta make a decision. Uh, door, door one or door two? I guess. I don't know. I guess I could stay with the first door. I don't know. You're gonna stay with the first door. Okay. Um. So. So you stay with the first door, I'll open the first door and it's a goat. It just happens to be a, a goat, unfortunately for you. So, so you lose out, but uh, the, the important part is this decision about whether or not to, to switch doors. So, so what do you think of that sort of decision um, uh, once you're given this new information that there's a goat behind door number three? So I guess once you're given a decision between the two doors, it's like a 50-50 yeah. chance that it's a goat. Yeah. So this is the like common uh, mistake. So the optimal strategy is actually uh, to switch. And if you switch, you actually increase the probability to find the car. Um, this is a this is actually an old like famous old math problem that uh, is actually quite um, counterintuitive, and a lot of people, including actually some famous mathematicians, have, have gotten gotten this wrong. So don't feel too bad. Um, we can we can um, sort of describe this problem in a decision tree. And hopefully this will, this will sort of um, uh, reinforce uh, the fact that, um, that's, that switching is actually the correct decision. So let's go ahead and sort of draw out that example. Um, Actually, before I do that, does anyone does anyone uh, disagree that this is the 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 correct solution? Is to switch? Is this uh, is it sort of screaming out against your your intuition? I personally have always been like, go with your first choice and your instinct, but clearly, <laughs> yeah. it's probably not correct. <laughs> So, so there was there's actually a sort of famous thing about this particular problem where like a bunch of mathematicians thought that the the, the decision was was uh, was it actually didn't matter because it'd be 50 50 and, and someone actually the way that that uh, you can convince them is to you could run this uh, scenario. Uh, in a simulation many times. Um, and you can see that if you choose not to switch, then you will, uh, you will lose um, more than uh, a person who, who does switch. And, and I, can show, I can show folks that if they are, if they are unconvinced. Um, but okay, let's do this decision tree. It's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit of an odd decision tree. Actually, many years back when I was trying to put this together in decision tree, it took me quite a long time to figure out. And the reason why it's counterintuitive is because uh, you start with a chance node. Um, so, okay. Um, So these, you, these are your possible decisions. Um, so this is switch and this is don't switch. Okay, switch, don't switch. 
Um, so two thirds of the time, uh, you picked wrong. Uh, and one third of the time you picked correctly. Okay, so hopefully everyone gets this like right at the beginning, right? There's three doors. Uh, two of the doors that you pick will be wrong. One of the doors that you pick will be correct. So if I pick the wrong door, um, then they show you the goat behind one of the doors you didn't pick. If you switch, you will win, right? And if you don't switch, you will lose. In the case where you pick the correct door, if you switch, you will always lose. Uh, oops, sorry, zero, not one. Uh, and if you don't switch, um, you will win. So if I look at the expected value of my switching decision, so that's the top guy here, this is equal to, switch. Uh, so two thirds times one plus uh, one third times zero. And this is equal to two thirds. And if you don't switch, it's two thirds times zero plus one third times one. And that's equal to one third. Uh, and so this goes back to um, Francisco's uh, question earlier about, oh, how would I know the probability? So in this case, right, like you can, you can kind of figure out the probabilities in, in this particular type of problem. Um, and so hopefully here we can sort of very clearly and easily see in this decision tree, right, that uh, the switching decision gives you a bigger payout than the sort of no switching. So if you switch, you'll win two thirds of the time. If you don't switch, you'll only win one third of the time. Uh, this is, again, uh, it's kind of easy to, to digest once this has been explained, but if, you, if you're just kind of like thinking about it, you know, in, in the moments in the game show, it's like, oh, it's 50-50 if I switch because it's like either I have it or the other one, but you, you're actually gaining information uh, from knowing what's behind uh, the other door um, and, and actually, and knowing that he's always gonna show you the wrong answer. And so uh, the important thing is to kind of take advantage of that extra information. And oftentimes, you know, a lot of these sort of counterintuitive decision-making types of things can be uh, sort of more easily digested if we structure these out um, systematically, like in a decision tree. Um, uh, oh, okay, so I see a question. So can you do it if the denominator is not three, but four or more? So yes, so this, this is, this is one of the ways, the famous ways that, that people have been convinced about this. Um, so it, it might not be, well, it, it's, uh, it might not be what, what you're thinking, but um, let's say now, um, and, and Duncan, I'll sort of call on you again to, uh, to solve, to do this new problem. Okay, so instead of three doors, there are now 1,000 doors, okay? So behind one door is a car and 999 doors have goats. So I say, Duncan, pick a door. And you say? I don't know, door 800 or something. Door 800, okay. So you, you have door 800. And then what I'm gonna do is I will open 998 doors 
And I'm and I show you that behind those 998 doors, they're all goats. And then I say, would you like to change your answer? I think I would definitely want to change your answer. Yeah. So it's exactly the same thing. Um, you've revealed that the rest of the doors, uh, you you kind of um, sort of cut them out, right? And so at the end of the day, it's like the the extra information that that you're gaining from doing doing that is uh, you get a lot more information than kind of your starting point. So that's that's the premise behind doing it with sort of multiple doors um, beyond beyond three. That's one of the sort of like empirical proofs that people have 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 used to show this uh, to solve the multi hall problem. Okay, let's, uh, okay, wait, I see, yeah, 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 so, so, yeah, that's what I was saying, um, if, uh, it, um, there's another comment in chat, if you open one door instead of the rest and only leave two options, so, so that's kind of what I was saying, it's, it's probably not what you think, that's, that's kind of how they replicate the uh, idea of, of getting um, sort of better information. Okay, so that is the sort of famous Monty Hall problem. Um, okay, another sort of important uh, context for decision making. Um, let me see here. Sorry, one second. So um, expected value of perfect information. So this is an interesting problem, um, sort of looking at uh, how much would you be willing to pay uh, for information about a particular decision. Um, so this can be, uh, really helpful for understanding um, uh, how to sort of reduce uncertainty and essentially uh, being able to understand the value of getting uh, certain information. Um, and so let's take a look at this particular problem. Okay, so we have um, this sort of possibility of looking at um, uh, sets of, of stocks. Um, so you are offered the following alternatives. Uh, you can buy stock one, and that can lead to 50% um, of the time, you make $1,500, 30% of the time you make $100, $100 and then 20% uh, of the time the stock goes down, you lose $1,000. Um, in comparison to stock two, 50%, $1,000, 30%, $200, $20, and 20%, you lose $100. So uh, if we compare the stocks, right, stock one is a little bit more aggressive, you can have a higher payout, but it but it also is more volatile. So um, there is a larger um, quantity of loss if the, if the stock goes down. Um, and then there is the sort of most conservative option, which is um, savings. And this sort of just guarantees, um, guarantees that you make uh, $500. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start out with um, we're going to start out with our sort of regular old um, decision tree, uh, and so I'm going to start with my decision node here, and I can pick a, a high risk stock, or I can go with low risk, 
or I can um, do a savings account. Okay, savings just nets me $500. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, for the high, high risk stock, right, we have a couple possible outcomes. So up, flat, down, and this is 50%, 30%, 20% with outcomes of 1,500, uh, 100, and negative 1,000. Same here, we have uh, up 50%, flat 30%, and down at 20%. And the payout here is 1,200 uh, and negative 100. So I can go ahead and calculate my expected values. So my EVs. So this would be 1500. So for this set, it's gonna be 1500 times 0.5 plus 100 times 0.3 plus negative uh, 1000 times 0.2. Uh, and this will end up um, being equal to uh, 580. I can do the same thing here. So 1000 times 0.5 plus 200 times 0.3 plus negative 100 times 0.2. And this ends up being $540. Okay, and so in this case, uh, answer is straightforward. I should invest with um, in uh, the high risk stock because the expected value is the highest at 580 compared to 540. Um, okay, so let's say, um, let's say that you could pay an advisor who, uh, some stock guru, um, who is able to tell you with absolute certainty which outcome you would, uh, you would receive if you bought stock one or if you bought stock two. And the question would be, how much would you be willing to pay that advisor for that information? Okay. Um, so, Let us think about this um, in a slightly different way. Um, actually, I'm gonna, going to sort of totally clear this. I'm going to draw a new decision tree and I'm going to kind of reverse this um, to help us decide uh, the value of knowing the information, uh, of, uh, of knowing the perfect information from this um, uh, potential guru. So what I'm gonna do is kind of similar to the Monty Hall problem. We're actually gonna start with a decision node. Um, so we have up 50%, uh, flat 30%, um, and down 20%. Okay, and here, you still have the same decision about high, high risk, low risk and savings. Uh, same here, we'll say HLS, high, low savings and HLS, high, low savings. 
Uh, and we know that if the market is up, you get $1,500 in the high risk, you get 1,000 in the low risk, and you get 500 in the savings. If the market is flat, you get 100 here, you get 200 here, and you get 500 here. And then if the market is down in the high, you get minus 1,000. In the low, you get minus 100. Oops. And then in the savings, you still get 500. Um, so my EV um, in each of these is actually much easier. Um, I would simply know the best outcome. I know which outcome I would choose in each of these cases. Uh, okay, so this would be, uh, oops. Uh, 15, oops, 1,500 here, uh, 500 here, uh, and 500 here. And if I went ahead and calculated the expected value based off the probabilities, um, I would get a number uh, equal to $1,000. Uh, $1, That's the uh, total expected value. So, if we look at the difference between um, knowing the outcome, which gives you uh, one thousand dollar EV, versus not knowing, which is a five hundred eighty dollar EV from the last decision tree, then your willingness to pay. Uh, this advisor should be equal to one thousand dollars minus uh, five hundred eighty. So you should be willing to pay this guy four hundred and twenty dollars to tell you if um, if the market is going up or if it's flat or down. Um, so this is known as the expected value of perfect information. And um, as I was mentioning before, is a way for us to um, be able to determine the value of uh, knowing the probabilities within, um, within your decision tree. Okay, um, any questions about that? So I, I do see a comment about thinking about anxiety. Um, so note that, uh, so, so yeah, this is a good comment. Um, we are explicitly right now thinking in terms of like a totally sort of economically rational actor who just operates off of um, um, expected, expected value outcomes. Um, that's not how most people kind of work. And so we're gonna be talking about um, risk behavior and attitudes uh, and, and how that will play into um, this sort of decision-making process. So it's a good good sort of transition comments. Um, okay, why don't we, uh, this is a good spot to take a quick break. Um, so let's take five minutes um, and we'll reconvene. And again, uh, if there's any questions about any of this stuff, I'll be here to answer.
Okay, let's get back into it and continue on. We'll talk about risk attitudes. Um, so I think this plays into what um, Francisco was just mentioning, sort of accounting for something like anxiety. Um, so we typically say that, um, you know, in, in, in these particular examples, um, for example, with the Pennzoil, you know, there's this probability that you could end up with like zero, zero dollars, right? And so for expected value, you know, that sort of outcome is typically achieved if you can, um, if you can essentially go through this um, process like many, many times, right? But a lot of decisions, in fact, I would say most decisions, you can only sort of play once. Um, and as a result, uh, the way that people make their decisions is a little bit less um, sort of directly corresponding to um, this expected value calculation. Um, and we can characterize the behavior of, uh, of individuals or, or entities as being risk averse risk neutral or risk seeking. Um, and this will influence the way decisions are made um, depending on the outcome of that decision. Um, and so this could be, uh, this could be the case. Um, importantly, you know, you could have the same sort of decision um, that can get drastically uh, different um, if the outcomes are, are, are different. And so one easy example of this is like uh, a, a coin flip. Okay, and so if I were to say, um, okay, Let's say if I flip a coin, um, if I get heads, then I get a dollar, uh, or you have to pay me a dollar, but if you get tails, then I'll pay you a dollar, right? And so at sort of lower stakes, um, you may be sort of more willing to kind of play this game. Uh, however, if I said, let me flip a coin, and if you win, you get $10 million, and if you lose, um, then you have to pay me $10 million. Uh, and you only get to play it once, right? So you can, you can think about yourself about, about whether or not you would kind of take that bet or not. Um, but certainly you could expect that sort of the population of decisions will change, even though, right, the expected value of this game is exactly the same. Um, and so a totally rational person, you would expect uh, to, to want to take that bet either way, um, or their sort of proclivity for taking the bet would be the same either way. Uh, whereas that's definitely not true, um, probably amongst the sort of general population. Uh, so risk in individuals. Um, so risk can change over a wide range of activities. Um, so you can't necessarily even just quantify, um, or, or you can't you can't uh, simply assign like one sort of assessment of risk, static assessment of risk to a single person because you know there are conditions in which this this could change. Um, we tend to think of most people um, as, um, as fairly risk averse, um, which means that we consider losses to be um, um, sort of worse uh, than, than winnings. Um, but there, there are like known conditions, right, which, which um, 
demonstrate risk-seeking behavior. So one easy example is playing the lottery. Uh, those are like terrible, terrible odds. You get negative expected value um, basically always, but, but like thousands, millions of people play the lottery. Um, and so this is risk-seeking behavior. Um, betting at casinos um, is also a losing proposition. There are no games that you can play with a positive expected value, um, but you know, thousands, millions of people, maybe millions, I don't actually know how many people play at casinos in, in Vegas, uh, but, but plenty of people participate in these games and that would definitely be considered like a risk seeking behavior. So it's not so easy to sort of quantify these things um, and the sort of context of your decision-making problem can change the way in which we assess risk. Um, this is uh, related to um, this concept of, of loss aversion. Um, and, and so you can characterize sort of um, people who are risk averse um, as, as having this sort of characteristic. This was sort of famously coined by um, Tversky and Kahneman in, in um, economics. Um, so the loss in utility from losing $100 is more than the gain in utility from winning $100. Um, so, if we if we were to um, if we were to think about uh, this problem, where okay, would you would you rather be given fifty dollars, um, or would you rather flip a coin um, and then heads you win a hundred dollars, but tails you get nothing? Uh, which of these two? uh which of these two outcomes would you sort of prefer you know uh the expected values are the same so you know from a sort of rational actor perspective um we would say that the decision should be the same um so actually let me let me pull the class give me a give me a thumbs up if you would be uh if you would rather be given um $50 than flipping a coin. Uh, and what is a different emote that you, you can do for, uh, give me other, any other, any other emote if you choose the alternative. Okay, we've got five to two, or yeah, five, six to seven, seven to two, I would say. Okay, so. Right, so many more people would prefer get taking the sort of uh, sort of fixed value, and and this uh, this in itself can can change um, it, it, if you um, kind of uh, if you modify the the outcomes and and keep the expected value the same. So let me let me ask this again. So. Um, instead of $50, you get $50 million. And then outcome two is no money or $100 million. Uh, same expected value. So uh, thumbs up if you would do $50 million. Any other emote if you would rather flip a coin to get $100 million. OK. Uh, we have all thumbs up. Right, um, and so you can see already that shifting the outcome and keeping the sort of game and EV the same uh, will affect people's um, sort of decision decision making, um, and and uh, and so we can see one easy example right of of changing the outcomes causing different decisions. Uh, but but also we're observing this really clear idea of loss aversion, right? A everyone in the room, uh, majority of the time, is choosing the certain outcome over sort of uh, getting nothing. And so this is 
the essentially one way we're sort of illustrating um, uh, this idea of, of, of loss aversion. Alan, quick question. Yeah. Um, another way I kind of see it is that you're not losing, like no money's coming out of your pocket. So is it still considered loss aversion if you're either stagnant at what you were when you started or have the possibility of getting more type of thing? Yeah. Yeah, so good question. Um, this this is kind of a convoluted way of doing loss aversion. Uh, normally, we would do like a negative amount, but in this case, um, it it is actually loss aversion because you are losing um, a uh, a sort of now known outcome. So you're like losing out on the on the fifty dollars essentially. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, so let's revisit the stock example with uh, this set of utilities. Um, and so these utilities, um, the way this is derived um, is that you may, so we, we just did this whole thing about um, figuring out, you know, how, you know, how many more people would switch this outcome if it was 50 million versus 100 million. And you can do these type of experiments to gauge the sort of value of getting big payouts, medium payouts, or, or, or no payouts. And, and we find that that, that kind of is, is nonlinear, right? And so if, if I look at, um, if I look at going from, uh, um, one thousand uh, dollars to fifteen hundred dollars. Uh, that's a five hundred uh, dollar value, but you only get uh, like a point one four gain in utility. Versus if I go from five hundred to a thousand, I'm getting point two one, um, even though it's the same difference. And so the way this works is like the first dollar that you get is the most valuable, but once you already have like a million dollars the next dollar that you get is like not quite as valuable. And so this is just a sort of nonlinear utility function that sort of decreases um, in sort of marginal gains uh, as you have more and more sort of money. And so this is kind of like a, a semi-realistic um, shape for, uh, for utility. And so we're gonna redo this decision tree uh, taking into account um the uh the utility values um so if i let me just really quickly sort of draw the tree again so we have a uh, high low savings and then it's something like this um up flat down up flat down uh, so 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.2. Okay. And my final things here, negative 100, 200, 1,000, um, negative 1,000, 100, 1,500. Um, okay. Uh, each of these has now has a um, utility associated with it. So this is profit, this is utility. Um, so this is one, uh, this is 0.46, this is zero, 0 0.86, 0.52. 0.33 and 0.65. So if I now repeat my expected value calculation, but I also multiply by the corresponding utility, what you end up with um, in the first set, you get 0 0.638. In the second set, you get 0.652. Um, and then in the last set, we get 0.65.
So if you remember in the first tree, we preferred the, uh, the high risk stock because it had the highest um, risk, uh, or sorry, it had the highest expected value. But in this case, the highest utility corresponds to the low risk stock. Um, even though the expected value is higher, the utility um, is, um, makes the expected utility higher for this particular option. And so in this way, uh, we, are, we are capturing this idea that, hey, maybe I don't wanna lose $1,000. Maybe that uh, the utility associated with losing $1,000 is really bad for me. And I prefer not to lose that $1,000 more than I prefer to um, you know, get $1,500. And so that tempers the, the sort of gain uh, of the larger payout. Uh, and it ends up making your decision uh, sort of focus on your, um, uh, on, on sort of this higher utility as opposed to just thinking about the expected value. And you can imagine that the utility function could be like totally different for different people and for different companies. Um, and therefore, uh, you know, the, the, it, it broadens the way that you could calculate um, uh, preferred outcomes in a decision tree. Um, all right, any questions about that? Okay. We'll talk about one more thing for um, uh, related to this idea about risk. So this is known as um, a risk premium, uh, which is the amount that you are willing to pay to avoid risk. Um, so risk aversion, uh, so RP, um, it means that your risk premium is greater than zero. Uh, someone who is risk neutral has a risk premium equal to zero and someone who's risk seeking would have a risk premium uh, less than zero. If you're risk neutral, it just means that you are sort of like an expected value actor. Um, the way that we calculate a certainty equivalent is based on the amount of certain money you would trade in exchange for some kind of uncertain outcome. Um, okay, and so let's kind of demonstrate a, an example of this. Uh, okay, I need a, a new volunteer uh, to do this. So anyone wanna help out here? I'll volunteer. Okay, great. Um, thank you. So we had this, uh, we had this um, example earlier. So $50 versus flipping a coin. Um, so, okay, which decision would you, which, which one would you prefer? Uh, are you ambivalent to both of these? Um, or would you prefer to take the $50 or would you prefer to flip the coin for zero or hundred? I would flip the coin. You would flip the coin. Okay. Um, and why, why would you flip the coin? Um, so in coordination with my question earlier of, it is an amount of money that, I mean, it's not $50 billion <laughs> that's guaranteed. So uh, I either get 50 or, uh, or sorry, I either get a hundred or I'm no worse off than I was when I walked into the option. Great. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, usually this doesn't go this way, but this is good. I like this. Okay, so um, let me change the, the conditions of the bet. Uh, $50 versus um, flipping a coin to get $99. Uh, 
what would you choose? I, I would still flip the coin. You would still flip the coin. Okay. Uh, Fifty dollars versus ninety-five dollars to flip the coin. Flip the coin. Okay. Uh, Ninety dollars. Flip the coin. Eighty dollars. Flip the coin. I think I wouldn't flip the coin if it was uh, sixty-five or okay. Below. Great. Between sixty-five and fifty, I would just take the fifty. Great. Okay. So uh, there are certainty equivalents is uh, fifty dollars um, and your expected value uh, is sixty five divided by two so thirty two point five um, divided by one plus RP um, okay so this would be fifty plus fifty RP equals thirty two point five. Um, Wait, perfect. why did you, how did you get the 32.5? You divided by two. Why? Uh, it's 50%. Um, so your expected value for the bet is uh, uh, 65 times 0.5 plus zero times 0.5. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So then it's 50 RP equals uh, negative uh, 17.5, I can do math. Your RP is equal to negative 17.5 over 50. You are a risk-seeking individual, um, right? Because we know that your risk premium is lower than one. Uh, yes, so you can see this is one way we can go about calculating sort of risk premiums. Uh, and based on your risk premium, I can say that you are a risk seeker, right? B based on the fact that you'd rather flip a coin than take the sort of certain outcome. Yeah. Uh, again, this is a risk premium that is associated with the context of this specific problem. Let's change the conditions, right? And say, you might not always be risk seeking. So let's say, uh, let me change it so that it's, um, let's say $50,000 versus flipping a coin for a $100,000 payoff. Uh, what would you, uh, which decision would you choose? Which, would you still flip the coin? No, I would definitely take the 50,000. Okay, you would take the 50,000. Um, okay. So now I'm going to try and elicit your risk premium uh, for this example, sort of going the other way, right? Um, okay, so 50K versus 100,000. Uh, let's say, would you do it for 105,000? Would you flip the coin? No. No, how about 120,000? Would you flip the coin? Yeah. <laughs> wow okay 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 so your certainty equivalence is now fifty thousand uh and your expected value is 120 wait what did i say 120 um yeah, yeah so 120 half of that right is sixty thousand divided by one plus your rp in this case it'll be you know fifty thousand rp uh, or equals 10,000. So your RP is equal to uh, uh, 0.2. Okay, so your risk premium is now positive, which means you are technically sort of risk averse, but you might be less risk averse than, than someone else. Um, so like, for example, who, uh, who, is there anyone in the class who maybe would not take the bet unless the flip coin flip was at like two hundred thousand um, dollars. So you you can imagine if if someone wouldn't take the bet until then, then you know this number would be two hundred thousand instead, and your risk premium would be uh, um, would be 0. 0.5, which means that they are more risk averse than um, than you. So okay, so. Uh, we can see 
this is a sort of nice way of easily being able to determine whether someone is risk averse or risk seeking. And we can also see how the context of the problem can sort of alter um, even like an individual decision maker's um, uh, risk premium value. Uh, and, and that there, you know, these things are not strictly uniform over the population. Some people are gonna be more uh, risky. Some people will be um, sort of more risk averse. This is the first time in five years that I've had, had a risk seeking person uh, doing, a, doing this uh, <laughs> uh, coin flip type of thing, so. Gotta shake things up. <laughs> Gotta shake things up, that's good. Okay, great. Um, we are going to take one last uh, example um, of a real world kind of application that I think is, is kind of neat, uh, a neat thing to illustrate um, of uh, where you can kind of uh, take advantage of the fact that people have risk premiums. Um, and, and this is a sort of common example of where um, insur in, in insurance, uh, this is exactly how this works, that uh, an insurance company can operate by taking advantage of your risk premium. So um, the reason why they can do this right, is that um, let's say, uh, you know, in this coin flipping example, you can imagine that your decision to, uh, your decision to take one way, one side or the other is going to change if you get to, if you get, get to make that choice many times over and over again. Uh, in the case where that happens, you would always take the one with the better expected value payout. The reason why we choose the $50 over the $100 oftentimes um, is because we only get to make that decision once and then that's where the kind of risk of making that decision uh, kicks in. Um, if you were allowed to make that decision many times over and over again, it eliminates the risk. In insurance, that is that is essentially the thing. The insurance company gets to see um, the expected value because they have so many customers. And so they can leverage the fact that they're doing expected value, whereas you're doing um, uh, you, like a utility-based uh, payout because of your, your risk. So let's, let's look at this sort of simple example. Uh, suppose you have a utility function, which we define here as 10 times W to the 0.3. At what insurance price would you buy insurance? And the situation we have on hand is you start with, uh, say, $2,000. Um, and there is a 90% chance that nothing happens. Um, let's say you have like a, I don't know, that, that sort of like a really expensive textbook, $2,000. 90% of the time, it's all fine. And 10% of the time, there's like a fire or something. Uh, and part of the book catches on fire and you lose $800 of value or whatever it is. Maybe a book is kind of a, a weird example. But OK, so let's, let's take a look at this sort of um, particular decision. Let's see. I'll just go ahead and do it on this slide. You have a decision to make. You can decide to uh, not buy insurance or you can buy insurance. Um, if I buy insurance, I will always get the value. Um, 2000 retain, but I have to make a payout. And that payout, let's say, is I. Um, if I don't have insurance, 
90% uh, of the time, my value is 2000. Um, and I don't have to make the payout, right? Cause I didn't choose to buy insurance. And then 10% of the time I lose $800. So it goes down to 1200. Um, okay, so that is the values and then the utility associated with this is 10 times 2000 to the point to the point three, which is equal to 97.793. Uh, and for this other guy, it is um, 10 times 83, oh, sorry, not 83, that's the answer. Uh, this is 10 times 1200 to the point three, which is equal to 83.899. The expected utility of this is equal to 96.9404. Actually, let me just explicitly write this. Oop. Let me explicitly write this out so that we can make sure there's no confusion. So it's 0.9 times 97.793 plus 0.1 times 83.899, that's equal to uh, 96.404 in terms of utility. If I now back calculate what the value of this would be um, from, our, uh, from our equation here, uh, if I go from utility into dollars, the value of this, um, would be 1906.84. Therefore, you should be willing to pay um, I is equal to $2,000 minus 1906.84. Uh, you should be willing to pay $93.16 based on your utility function. Um, and, and that would let you sort of break even on your uh, utility, right? And so that would make, um, that would make this outcome the same as this outcome. So, Alan, so um... yeah. I have one question. So in this scenario, this is if you're paying uh, $93.16 once, but let's say in the scenario of like, I don't know, homeowner's insurance or something, you're not gonna pay that once. You're gonna pay that every year for like 30 years. So how would you consider the amount you pay? Would you divide that by that much? Or would you consider that there's various risks that might recur. Um, yeah, so if this is the same risk every year, if it's, if it's a 90% and 10% chance um, as a representation of the sort of annual sort of risk, um, then, then this is what you would pay annually. You could recalculate this to go over a full, say, 30 years, let's say that's like what you would expect to, uh, like the lifetime of the house or something, or how, how long you'd expect to live there. You know, you could do a recalculation of, of this um, where you'd have to do, you know, what's the probability of the bad outcome not occurring over and over. So it's like one minus um, um, the, the outcome sort of multiplied across uh, annually. Uh, and I believe that you should end up with the same answer. Um, so basically you just have to choose the, um, the probabilities based on the time window you're talking about. So like, yeah, if the 90% yeah. chance is uh, an annualized 90%, then that's, yeah. that, that works out. 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And if this represents like the full 30 years, then this is the amount that you just... pay over the full 30 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So hopefully this kind of makes sense to everyone, um, right? We, we just basically want to make the branches of your decision tree sort of equal. And so in the case, you know, uh, you, you are, you're actually kind of just breaking even in this case. Now let's look at it from the perspective of the insurance company. So for insurer, remember the insurer gets to operate at expected value, right? They get to do this many times to many, many, many different people. So they have an EV and their expected value is, uh, is only if you buy uh, insurance. And 90% of the time, they make $93.16. 10% of the time, they have to pay um, $800. Um, yeah. And so, you'll find that if you calculate this number, you get some positive number here. Uh, and that, that means that they are actually sort of making money off of this transaction. Uh, and the reason why it's not zero like it is for, for you and in the, in the, uh, the individual who's doing this expected utility is it is exactly because um, they are being able to operate using expected values as opposed to this sort of nonlinear uh, uh, risk uh, utility function. Um, yeah, so the insurance company gets to win out because they are able to take advantage of the fact that we are risk averse. Okay. Any questions about that? This is kind of like a sort of final culmination, combination of all the things um, uh, that we talked about today for sort of modeling our, our decision making. Okay, um, so that will sort of conclude um, today's lecture. We'll end a little bit earlier. Um, and I'll, uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about this at the beginning of the class next time, but our second homework, which will, uh, which will uh, be assigned on Tuesday is gonna be looking at these type of problems. It's gonna be a very sort of unique homework where we're gonna be eliciting sort of your own risk preferences, but we'll, we'll get more on that um, uh, next class. Um, so I, because I'm kind of ending a little bit early, I'll stick around for any questions, especially if folks have questions on the homework, which will be due uh, at the end of class today. Or not end of well, class, sorry, end of the day, not end of class. Sorry, Ms. Spoke, just wanna make sure you guys are still on your toes. <laughs>